Good evening and welcome to Beyond Room 313 Symposium with my colleague uh, Jason Robba over in Seattle. Today we have a woman from the sunny southeast of Ireland, from the Waterford, Cork area, an artist known by the name of Maria Tanner Cohen. I met Maria a few years back and I've been following her art for a long time and she's definitely someone that caught my interest because her art definitely went somewhere else in terms of you could see it exploring her the ancient Celtic pagan pre-Celtic landscape of Ireland and things like megaliths started to come into her artwork as well as mythology and so I wanted to bring Maria on to talk about the evolution of the artist returning back to the source and so on so how are you Maria it's lovely to have you here I hope you're keeping well and down I'm very hot down there today I'd imagine oh it's um uh, yeah I'm Thomas, thanks so much for having me here. I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, you're right, it's lovely and hot. I went for a swim this morning and um, just to enjoy the good weather. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing well and I'm very happy to be here. Thanks. Well, I'm delighted you came on because I want when we started this program, we decided we wanted as many artists as anyone else. And mm -hmm. so you were at the top of the list of the artists I wanted on here. Now, can you tell us about your journey that brought you to this point in your creative life? Okay, well... Um... That's a, that's a good question, and I suppose it's a good place to start, you know. Um, I grew up in a, in a humble country home in the southeast of Ireland. I had two very loving parents, and they were also very passionate about life. Um, they, um, they were also very devout Christians, Catholics. So, um, you know, my experience growing up is that, that I would have been, you know, a very much um, affected by their experience of their own spirituality, you know. And they always wanted to kind of experience more of what the faith could could give them. Like, you know, they, they wanted to, what, what more of what the faith could embody. So kind of beyond what the, you know, the simple Sunday sermon of the priest on the altar, you know. So my experience growing up was like during the 80s and 90s was what you could call like, you know, maybe the underground of, of the Catholic faith in Ireland at that time. So, um I suppose myself and my siblings would have been brought along to like the apparitions that were popping up around Ireland in those in those early days. And like, you know, later on, then like, you know, um, say maybe between the ages of eight and 12, um, uh, my parents joined the Latin Tridentine order, you know, and um, they would have and a lot of people will know, like that was the breakaway church after Second Vatican Council. And um you know, it was, it's like, when I think about it in retrospect, it was a kind of an interesting experience because I got to see what the Christian church was like, I suppose, going back as far as 1570, right through to 1965, once the laicization of the church happened and they, they changed the massive vernacular. So, I mean, I, I got to see those, those very old Christian rituals and things like that. And then I suppose later on in my teens, my parents joined the charismatic movement. So like, you know, I would have seen you know rooms full of people like you know speaking in tongues simultaneously while somebody's over in the corner getting waylaid in the spirit by the power of collective prayer like you know and healing and there, there was an intensity and an energy around that that was really quite overwhelming for a young person to experience and then at other stages I suppose I would have like found myself sitting in the middle of an exorcism mass you know like while the the priest is swiping the crucifix around the room like drawing out the demons of all the poor faithful sitting around like you know and there was something like like the 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 energy and and the tension in the room would be palpable like you know but it was kind of it's it's kind of funny when I think of it in retrospect because like you see all these poor people and they're trying to hold on to their demons like and there's this serious call to, to pull things out energetically but uh yeah I mean th that that was kind of my experience growing up you know there was th that kind of thing and there was a lot of it and there was an extremity and a volatility to that experience you know that kind of left me with this sense of kind of having one foot in this world and one foot firmly planked in another world that, that I didn't even have a name for and the the that kind of experience, I suppose, it, it, it built up to a level of intensity in my own psyche that 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 was it was almost like, you know, I don't know, I, I, I just it, like to the level of a pressure cooker, you could say. So when I finally came to become an artist, it was almost like finding a creative outlet in, in, in adult life was almost non-negotiable for me. So. By the time I got to the age of about 18, I, I understood art as a kind of, you know, a release valve for psychic tension. 
And it was, uh, you know, it became kind of like a soul medicine to integrate kind of, you know, the extreme of experience. And um, yeah, like the, the, the more I made art, the more the compulsion to create kind of continued. And, and I think that was probably the beginning of my artistic journey. I think that's where it began, like, you know. Well, that's really interesting. The, I, I've never met anyone who was in the Tridentine Church before. Yes. Uh, I, I know about them. I've, you know, I, I know that they, what they represent, they're, they're, they, they, they are the, the original Catholic Church before Vatican II. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you they were, were the masses conducted in Latin? They were completely in Latin, yeah. So, so the protocol was like when I was, well, I was young, like, but as I remember it, like, you know, we used to travel to Cork and the, and the mass was always held in Moore's Hotel. There was no church at that time. So they had it in the back room of Moore's Hotel in Cork. And we get up early in the morning, but you had to be fasting an hour before communion. And then we travel up like, you know, and then there'd be like, there'd be, most people would go to confession before communion because there was a serious sense of the sanctity of, of receiving yeah. the Eucharist. And you had to have like, had to be in a state of purity because there was a, there was a greater sense of the sanctity of the ritual, the Catholic ritual before, you know, the, the, the laicization happened and things like that. So yeah, everything was in Latin, you know, the priest would have his surface in Sutan and I had all the kind of the liturgical responses, even as a small girl, I knew the liturgical responses in Latin. So, and you'd wear like your mantilla, you had to cover your head and, you know, there was a time in it and, and it was, it's interesting, like, you know, when I think of it in retrospect, but there was a kind of a, you know, there was a dourness to it as well, like in the disciplinarian sense, like you had to kneel down, you sang the solemn hymns and you prayed the solemn prayers and the priest had his back turned to you, you know, so yeah, yeah, it was, it was an interesting, interesting experience. Yeah, I've always wanted to experience a Latin mass. You know, something that goes right back to that—that that really comes from pagan times. Would have been similar to the services at the the Temple of Jupiter in Rome and stuff like that. It just became mm -hmm. because it was just some. So it's like I'd have it. It must have been a really well. You were in a hotel. So you weren't in a proper basilica or something. So they, I don't get imagine... on, though. they did get a church later on. Eventually, after a couple of years, they raised funds. I think now it's up some up on the top of Sunday's well. So you can go to the mass to have an experience of it. And it is a unique experience because it brings you back in time, you know, to, yeah. to, 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 to how like that, that the, the psyche of the early or early Christian Catholic was formed, like, you know, so before that disjunction happened later on. So it's, it's, it's worth visiting and worth seeing as well. And I think that they, they'd welcome you. They might not, but they, they might as well, you know, so. Plus they would have been an outsider in Ireland then. You would have been from an outside family. And I think those kind of things do they are the kind of a furnace of art, art, artistic stuff. So many people I know were interesting, were raised in what we would call offbeat religions or yeah, what yeah. people like to call cults or, or just like unorthodox mainstream religions. But I often find that like really amazing people come out of these because mm -hmm. there's something about that. They're already non-conformist to begin with. So it mm -hmm. begins at an early age. They have to learn how to survive in a world that sees them a little funny or a little different. Mm, yeah I definitely felt that kind of outsider experience like as a kid growing up because there was the, the tridentine and then there was the, the the apparitions and things like that and you know I always as a kid it was very hard I really wanted to to be the same as the other kids but it, they I, I wasn't the same and I knew it you know and the, I suppose there was I felt like the other kids like they knew like about the Simpsons and they had TVs and stuff I grew up with no TV we didn't even have a phone in the house growing up you know right so it was but it's not that we didn't have adventure and we didn't have fun, but there was also this kind of extreme of experience as well that we had to encounter, you know, so much of the time that it kind of, it, it was kind of isolating for us as kids in a way. We had each other, I had loads of siblings, you know, and I was glad of that. But, you know, beyond that, there was an area that there was a kind of a breach where you couldn't bridge that difference between yourself and the other kids. Like, so, yeah. I'm outside, not, I'm outside not was a big thing, I'm like. I'm not going to let you pass on the apparitions. I assume you're talking about Bally Spittle and down in Cork. Yeah, there, there would have been, but there, that was one of them. That's the better known one, the Bally Spittle. And I was there yeah. as well, but I was also in um, another place in, in Grantstown in, in County Wexford, um, where there was the apparitions happening there. There was two girls, they were called Sally Ann and Judy, and they used to go into ecstasy. So they'd, they'd, they'd have their hands like this and they would lean right back and they'd stay in that position for an hour or more, you know? And then there was the, the Ross Moor um, in Inchigila in West Cork as well. There was a site of apparition there as well. So, so I would have gone to those too. I was at Bally Spittal for the first time last year. There was no one around. Yeah, that's remote, yeah. 
there's something magical about that 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 hillside. Mm. I think like and also it's like also if you look at Lourdes and Fatima, mm. always caves involved. That's right, yeah. Caves around Bally, Bally Spittle. And I often wonder, like, it was the landers. I found, I, actually, I'm not Catholic. I don't I mean, you know, I'm a pagan. And I found a great sense of, I had a lovely sense of peace there, standing at the grotto, under the Marian Grotto. Mm. So there's something definitely going on in Bally Spittle. There's something very magical about that, 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 hill, that small hillside. Well, this is, it's interesting that you say that because a lot of the times the seers, like, they, they, like, they would face a rock face or, like, um, you know, like a woodland area or wooded area, or maybe like, like you were saying, like, uh, you, know, you know, an embankment or something like that, when they, when, when they go into kind of ecstasy or whatever it was. And, you know, these were the places from where the, the divine emanated, you know, the, these, and, and a lot of people at that time, when I was a kid, I remember them saying, you know, like, uh, isn't it, isn't the peace incredible? Like, isn't, isn't, isn't it so peaceful? And even as a kid, I remember that there was a great sense of stillness that could be, you know, got from these places. Like, and maybe it was like that, that collective coherence of prayer, or it was the, the, the fact that there was maybe a holy well, and there was this, this beautiful underground, you know, the, 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 geomagnetic energies of underground water or whatever it was or the two coming together but there was yeah. incredible there was a pure energy to be had in those places yeah. at, the, at those times you know my, my i had a painting friend uh, john in dublin he's dead now um, i used to go painting around dublin with him mm-hmm. and uh, watercolor painting he was my art one of my art friends he had been to bally spittle when it was all that the, the apparitions were going on now he is he, well he was uh, a hardcore atheist and he said that the statue moved. Yeah. And I said to him, I said, what? And he goes, everyone gasped and the statue moved. I saw the statue moving. It came to life. Yeah. And I said, well, how do you explain that? He goes, it was some kind of hypnotism, but it really mm-hmm. didn't move, Thomas. I, I, the people are not lying, but it was some kind of hip- hypnosis. Uh, mm-hmm. And I just said to him, well, you know, I was telling him, about, he knew nothing about quantum physics and stuff, but maybe you tapped into some other realities there. And he said, maybe, maybe. Now, he was an atheist the day he died. And he was like, uh, no, a death, the statue definitely moved. And he said that, like, it didn't make him religious, but he said that it, 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 when he saw the thing move, it nearly it rattles him to his core. You know, that kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. I totally, I totally get where he's coming from because... You know, we we were dragged along to our parents's, you know, where where you know our parents were into the religion, they were into the Tridentine, they were into the apparitions, they were into the they were into all of that. It was really an intrinsic part of their their passion and, and their spiritual journey. But we were the kids and we were being dragged along. So there was a kind of a cynicism in us too as kids. Like we're like, oh God, here we have to go again. Oh shit, we have to pray again, you know. But I remember when I was in Inchigila, like in West Cork, not in Balance Pithy, but in Inchigila. Everybody's like, do you see the statue? Our lady's moving, our lady's moving. And I was like, what? Like, what? You know, and I looked around. And there she was, like the statue, and it was shimmering. It was shimmering like this. So I was like, you know, what's going on? I start to rub my eyes, like to really get a, st- like, I- am I losing it here? Like, you know, but I did rub my eyes and I looked and it was still shimmering. And I rubbed my eyes again and it was still shimmering, you know? So, so yes, I don't know about hypnotism, but that, that, you know, there's there's numerous ways that that that, that the mind can break down the, the fabric of reality, like you know, that the, the power of the collective projection or, or, or that, that that sense of expectancy that the statue would even move, like you know what I mean? I mean, or, we can't or, underestimate the power, like you know. Our spirit actually came into it. I our mean, spirit actually came this into is what it. drove the, the the iconoclasts hmm. in ancient Greece and Rome, the smashing the statues because they the pagans had similar experience the statue of apollo came to life the statue of athena came to life you want yeah. to say that, jason yeah i just think that's so interesting that idea what you were just saying tom is that that you know the collective focus onto an object that you know that that could very well bring some some kind of exterior being into it and that yeah growing up as a kid i i, I can relate to maria that i was mm-hmm. part of a uh, uh, my parents were part of a religion that was very unorthodox so i was always on the outside and part of this group, but always longing for something. But whenever I'd go to my, my uh, friends who are Christians or uh, they whenever they would take me to church and stuff, it would always just be so bland and blah, but this is just so interesting to hear like your experience with, with the, uh, their growing up. Cause it's like that kind of stuff really fascinated me as a kid. Like you said, what is it? The, 
apparitions. That's something I'm not familiar with. You, it, you were talking about girl going back into like some sort of a trance state. And like ecstasy, a, in a, yeah. they, they called it ecstasy. Yeah. Um, ex- yeah. 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 And there's um, videos, Jason, there's videos of the, there's a famous case of Guadalajara in Spain of girls in the 60s. And you they have that they have them on the video have video footage of them in the sixties walking around which are, and they're praying to like invisible beings. Yeah. And they hold that position for hours. That's the thing that they they you know they could see they could continue to walk, but yeah. their heads are completely back. They don't see where they're going, but they don't fall over anything. They can walk, you know, through towns and everything without without any issue. You know, it's it's kind of amazing yeah. to see it. Because yeah, if Catholicism didn't have a centralized structure like the Vatican, it would be the most magical of all the, the Abrahamic religions in terms of giving you that stuff, you know? Mm. It gives it's, you the witchcraft, it gives you, this, it gives you the magic, you know, the trans... Yeah, but, but, but it does, but it does, outside the, the, the orthodox, like it, outside the institutional church, there is the underground side of the Catholic church, and that, that exists, it still exists, it's very much alive, but it's not, it's not within the institution of the church. Yeah. You go there and you're bored out of your brain, like, and you're, you're patronized and you go home feeling sorry for yourself. It's not the same thing. It's like there's two different churches running in Ireland still, I think, you know. Yeah. Could be a remnant even of the Celtic, early Celtic, uh, Chaldeas kind of that mystical groups that were half pagan, half druidic. I think those mm-hmm. underground churches and on the uh, sort of like, sort of like rebel Catholics in Ireland, they're sort of like subconsciously harkering back to those days, I think, in many ways. Most definitely, Thomas. I can tell you when I was out in Shakila, like um, that. That's back in Westport. Um, like there would have been times when um, speaking to to that that kind of like uh, the correspondence between that or 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 the 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 reemergence like of that of that ancient pagan way. Like at maybe it was you know it could have been three o'clock in the morning, right? And and we would um, we we'd be barefoot and we'd have to walk the rounds and uh, you you walked the rounds next to the holy well in the grotto and all you had was was a candle a lit candle and the sound of prayer to guide the way and these were the ceremonial rites that would take place t- take place before an apparition you know so that that kind of that. There, there was something happening there, there was a fusion there between the very ancient memory and, and, and the more contemporary you know Christian ritual you know there was something happening there yeah. So did you did you take this later on as you grew up in life, finding it your own and then realizing that, like you're saying, there's a magic there that's superimposed or underneath the control system, and then be able to take that and do something of your own with it, like with your artwork. I was reading about how you talk about going into the stone circles and there being, you know, visionary type experiences that people have. So it's like you had this young experience of actually experiencing the magic and then that magic is yours then. As a kid, and then and in your adult life, were you able to take that magic itself, strip away all the dogma and you know bullshit that was there, and have that like as your own form of magic to take into into your art and into your own experience in life? Yeah, I, I definitely say that like you know having that kind of like going to those sites of apparition when you'd have these emanations of the divine, and like this this sense of the the you know the sacredness of ritual, and also like you know this notion of, of the sacredness of the land. I remember when I, I was young, my grandmother, she used to hold these, um, you know, a, a, every every May Day, which we call Bialtana here in Ireland, she would have this, um, the May Day celebrations. And herself and my mother would pr- prepare the May Day flowers, you know, and all the women and all the girls um, would, 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 you know, create a procession and the men would join as well and the procession would be led by the priest and he would bless the land you know at, at, at Bialtana and then they would have after those rites were performed they they then have the mass and everybody would celebrate after that and um you know the, so, so that sense of the sacredness of the land was always there in my understanding somehow and it was a kind of it was a kind of hybrid hybridized in that there was this kind of sense of you know a very ancient you know, ancient ritual and way bubbling up. And these were kind of converging with, with, with the Catholic rituals and rites. And I think when I finally came to, to um, you know, awaken to the ancient sites of Ireland and the stone circles and things like that, it was, it, it was, it was a natural spiritual gravitation for me, if you like, you know. So when I first made the, the, the first painting that I made uh, about the, the ancient sites in Ireland was called The Druid's Dream. And it was not necessarily, I wasn't referencing any particular ancient site. It was more the birthing of their importance and their presence in my understanding, you know, 
So yeah, it's definitely a connection. Definitely. That, that's that's very interesting about your parish celebrating Beltane. Mm. Bel- because I think that goes a lot on a lot in Ireland, where a lot of parish priests do kind of backdoor encourage or keep the pagan festivals going. Up here in Sligo, they don't celebrate Samhain with bonfires. They celebrate St. John's Eve, and they call that their bonfire night. And that goes back to, if you look at the, at the history of that, that goes back to Roman soldiers celebrating uh, the uh, the festival of Baal, the, the, the Egyptian or the Mesopotamian uh, fertility god or semantic fertility god. The, mm. the Romans incorporated that in. And that made its way all the way to Ireland through Scotland and into like Ulster and down into Sligo. And yet it has remained from probably mm. s- Roman soldiers stationed at Hadrian's Wall 2,000 years ago, somehow mm. affected the local people there and, and ended up over here. I find that stuff amazing, how it's, it, 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 you get these isolated pockets of paganism. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Of Ireland and, and, and other, other Catholic countries. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it is, it's quite extraordinary, like, isn't it? But like, the, there was definitely, you know, the, the, you could call it a co-opting or, 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 or kind of a sitting on top of, like, because, you know, Samhain now for, for the Catholics is, is all Saints Day, isn't it? Yeah, you know, and and that's supposed to be the portal moment. You know, the, the, you know, the, the, the stories align so similarly because it's supposed to be the portal moment when, when it, the spirits can move through the spirits of the dead can move through and and all sorts of maybe darker entities can move through as well in the christian understanding yeah you know but that sound is also a transitional time for the pagans most definitely you know well jason you know yourself that day of the dead they celebrate in uh, in in your part of the world the Me- mexican americans uh, jason grew up in southern california originally mm-hmm. and that's like around ha- halloween sound as well isn't it that's around that period yeah, Dia de los Muertos, yeah, the day of. And a very Catholic festival, you know, very Catholic, but it's really pagan. Yeah, yeah. very magical too. Like I, I myself never celebrated or had friends or girlfriends that did that, but just the the masks and the 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 art and aesthetics that went along with it, it was just pure magic. Like just being being in proximity to it, you could you could you could feel the really energy coming off of it that day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so you did this painting. It was called the, was it the Druids? The Druids Dream, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did that become a kind of an opening door, a portal? Did you have an experience doing that painting that said to yourself, okay, this is the path? Yeah, I, I definitely think that I did when when I made that painting. So so I prior to making that painting, okay, so it was a natural spiritual gravitation to to kind of to awaken onto the, the ancient sites uh, uh, all across the world, but then bring it into the particular and realize that they're all over Ireland as well. And then, of course, I was listening to you and I was listening to the, to the fantastic work of Maria Wheatley and, and reading stuff around. And it, and it just, the whole thing started to spark off on my consciousness. But when I made that painting, I, I, I really felt like that, you know, the hand of inspiration reached yeah. through to that work. And, and, and I really, you know, I didn't feel like I even necessarily composed the work myself at all. Like I was just a, a you know, a vessel to, to, to realize something. And I think that the message of that work was very clear to me once it was made. And it was that our, our ancient ancestors are, are still very much energetically aligned to these ancient places. You know, and and so I I figured you know the, the forms are sort of semi recognizable human forms, and they because they are semi human they, they become an embodiment, an ancient embodiment of, of of knowledge and wisdom, and it's just for us to 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 recognize that to align with that ancient and very pure message. You know, so, you had you had one painting that showed. Um... For Kim, I don't remember the title, but it shows uh, mount, be- mounds, passage mounds, cairns. Mm-hmm. But they're, uh, they're almost done like the mountains of Ireland, as if mm-hmm. the stars, sh- they're just the, like the show, they're part of the country. They're, mm-hmm. they're part, even though they're man made, they're part of Ireland. You know, I, I, love, mm-hmm. I, I love the way that painting looks. The, the, I'm trying to think which painting is it. I'm wondering, is it in Dahab, the many different places? There's, there's two passage mounds with the entrances and it's. Yeah. And it's yeah, like, yeah, it's like yeah. but they look more like two hills in landscape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 and is there a big cloud in that painting? Is there? Yeah, it was a while back. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it was when your style was more kind of like it was you were still at that geometric thing going on, mm-hmm. where you were sort of like resolving the landscape into shapes and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I noticed now your stuff is a lot more fluid and things like that. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I mean, that's probably also part of the thing. But 
when you do a painting, is it always from the stream of consciousness or do you go to a place or do you have a sketchbook and call from that? Oh God, it's changed over the years, you know, it's, it's, it's different every time. But um, I'd say like, you know, I think if you look back at my very early work, you can kind of see from going through the website, like um, maybe right through to, to the present day work, which is more these kind of semi, you know, figurative forms that could be stones, could be humans. Uh, there's this kind of like, there is this consistent motif of like a, of, of spectral figures, if you like, you know. And they, I think, are... Um, how would I describe them? They're like, you know, they're, they're, they're like the spirit forms that I've carried with me through my life, the ones that I've carried over from my childhood and the ones that have marked different stages along my spiritual journey, my artistic journey. And the, 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 the paintbrush becomes like the tool to invite them to invite them in from the invisible you know, to kind of to invite them into recognition. So that's, that's what I do. And that's what I did. Um, I, I always generally work intuitively, you know, so I kind of rely on the inner prompts and the, the inherent magic of chaos rather than external forms and, and, and images. And, um, you know, like, like even when I was a kid, like, you know, I, I'd spent ages looking at the biomorphic forms in clouds and in in trees and in the lats of cut wood and in, in the fire and in the shadows. Like I, I could see, I could see, you know, forms everywhere. Like they were just waiting to be called out by sort of sort of a, a willing and, and perceptive eye, like, you know? So being open to the, the those kind of biomorphic forms in nature, um, I was open to it in paint as well. So like a spill or, or a gesture could kind of set the coordinates in the terms of the work, you know? So and and then when you're working in that way, like you, you're you're working you're working very ex intuitively, and to work intuitively is definitely to work imaginatively, experimentally, you know. And that can take hundreds of hours of attention, or it can be like you know you you hit this moment of of inner and outer equilibrium, and like inspiration reaches through to the work because you captured something, you know, you you compress something, some sense or feeling. And that work can be resolved within within that moment, in that window. And then there are other times where, like, you know, you can overburden the work with too many ideas and thoughts. And it can be very, very hard to, to draw the work back from the energetics of that, you know. But, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, it, it's, it's all intuitive, really, I suppose. Yes, I, to answer your question. I don't know if I'm answering the question. I have no clue, but, you know. It's the artist's lot in life, and just like yourself, the muse plays a huge part, and I'm sure Jason agrees that the muse plays a huge part in his musical composition. It's it's the same hidden hand, the, the daemon, the muse. There's something there mm. that kind of, like, pulls it out of you. Yeah. And what you were saying about the forms in the landscape, like that painting behind you, you I see how you've anamorphized our, the, the stones to make them like humans. And that's part of a very long tradition. Like a lot, a lot of megalithic sites are often named after people because they look like them or long Meg and her daughters and the roll right mm -hmm. stones are and so on. And they're, they're all named after people that have a face or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very integral to Michelangelo when he carved his classical statues. By the way, when he had that, mar when he had those marble um, Carrera marble chunks, he would yeah. say, "Oh, Moses is in there, Julius Caesar's in there." And he saw it in a square, gigantic chunk. It yeah. just has to be extracted from it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And what you're doing with that painting behind you is you're uh, to me now as an observer is you're pushing the people back into the into the into the stone. Would I be correct in that? Yeah, I, I guess so. I guess so. I mean, the, the, the thing is, so it's such an intuitive process, like, you know, that and, and I've always been inclined to that seductive use of line. I kind of move my brush around like this. And so the forms kind of naturally evolved, you know, to these lovely curvaceous sort of bending forms like. But this you're right, like they, they I don't know what, what it is, but maybe it's because I've always been kind I've always you know, had these kind of spirit forms lingering around my work. They're coming through in this way now, at this stage in my kind of artistic and spiritual development. But the, the, this painting is like, you know, you've got these, these stones or, or kind of semi-recognizable semi human forms, and they're all in communion with one another in this painting. You know, and there's, you can see some in the foreground, and then there's many more in the background, you know, and they're kind of standing in this, this suffused space, like they're standing in like some sort of eternal sunshine. And I just... 
I mean, I made this painting intuitively, so I, I, it's open to intuitive reading, but I, I, I see it as something that, you know, it, it, it kind of visualizes a dimensional space where, where you know, maybe that somehow it represents the energetics of these forms. Some of, them, some of them even look like flickering flames on a candle exactly, made of stone. Exactly, exactly. I, I love that you hit on that because that's exactly what I was thinking too. There, there's the, the, the flame of the fires in there too, these, these forms, absolutely, for sure. Yeah. Uh, do you go around to many megalithic or ancient sites or old ruined churches for inspiration? I do, yeah, I do. And I have lovely experiences now. Well, no, they're not all lovely, actually. I, I, there was one incident. Well, I'm trying to get around to the ones that are, are close to me as well, you know. But uh, not that terribly long ago, I had an experience. Um, I'll tell you, um, I, I have a friend of mine and she lives down in Wexford. And um, her partner was going through some old um, OS maps that he came across, you know. And he came across the, this circular enclosure. And he seemed to think that it was, you know, uh, it could have been a medieval you know, site for keeping animals or maybe where people lived and stuff. And he said, do you want to go visit? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to see it. So off we went anyway. And it was kind of off the side of an oak forest in a farmer's field. And when we got to the edge of it, there was um, that, uh, you know, that, that infamous um, a mushroom, you know, the fly agarchic with the red cap and the white spots on it. And, you know, and I think about it in retrospect, that would have been a red flag, you know, but um, we didn't, we failed to read the landscape properly. So, and, and we were going off of that information that it was medieval, whatever. So in we went anyway, and there was a lot of scrub and there was a lot of trees and stuff there. And it was quite a big enclosure. And the further we went in, the energy started to change. And I felt that this, this kind of static uh, noise inside my head that was building up to the level of pressure and I, my heart started to palpitate. And when I looked up, like this, the lads were there in front of me and like simultaneously they were like, you know, acknowledging the fact that the energy in here is not good, not good at all. Like, you know, and to confirm that even more, the small dog that was with us, he started to whimper and, 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 and cower down and back out. And uh, dear, my friend said, like, you know, he, he never, ever does that. Like, so we knew, you know, we knew we had to get out of there quick. We knew we were someplace we weren't supposed to be. So we high tightailed it out of there as quick as we possibly could. And um, we, we, we realized then after that, that we had been in, we were in a fairy ring, like we had gone into to the place of the she and we shouldn't have. And, and her partner said, you know, later on, he discovered that it was actually called Rath Fawdeen, you know, so it, it was a, a fairy ring. Uh, mm -hmm. So when, when I went home that evening, I, 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 I made reparation, like I picked a bunch of flowers, small little flowers from my garden. I left them outside the door to make amends to the she because I didn't want to, to offend them in any way. And I didn't want any repercussions from, so I made the sincere reparation in those little bunch of flowers. But I like, you know, I think, you know, like there's going to be a lot more of that because the, the, the greater the, the deepening of the forgetting is in this country, the more we forget about these ancient sites and the, like the stories were there to protect us. Like you don't go into a fair and you, you don't put down the shiak gal. You know, you, 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 have to, you have to respect these places. So the, 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 the more that people don't know about these things, the more occurrences there will be. Like people are going to encounter the she again, for better or worse, you know, they, those, the energetics of that will be felt, I feel, you know. We, so, had, Pat, we had Pat Noon on a few nights ago. Yeah. East Galway talked about that. And, and other people, a, a, a lady called Kate Ray down over in England. And we all come to the same consensus. Speaking of those old maps, they're the old, old Discovery series, Irish government OS maps. Yeah. I collect them because they're absolute gold mines for megalithic yeah. hunting because they, they, they stopped publishing them now. They went out of print in the early 2000s because of the internet. But if you can get them, they're yeah. much better for looking at site. Oh, you can open up a big map and yeah. every Every megalithic site in the country has been recorded, no matter even if it's just a single standing stone or something. And you can actually understand the landscape better when you mm. look at the paper map in front of you, yeah. as opposed to going on the internet and looking at their, their digital map. Mm. Those, those maps are pure gold for like, like before, when I first started, uh, started go going out hunting megaliths many mm. years ago, they were in, they were invaluable, you know, <laughs> invaluable. Like I grew up in Ballymore on the north side of Dublin and yeah. Just north of, north of the airport, there were hundreds of megaliths, mm. you know, including, you know, four knocks and, and the other ones like that at North. Serious megaliths as well. Mm. And, and, you know, and people don't have that now. They just, it's, they don't have that. The opening up the map was almost like opening up 
the map in Lord of the Rings. You know what I mean? When you go, you I go down to Waterford and I'd open up the local, I'd buy the local Discovery series map and I'd open up and where's all the megaliths? You know, it was like it was like Frodo, it was like Frodo in, in, in the Middle Earth. You know, it felt like it felt like that. You don't have that with the internet. You just don't have it. No, you don't have it. But it's definitely, geez, there's definitely so much to explore. Like it's a whole, the whole thing is, is just blowing open for me. Like, and it's a fascinating journey. I really feel like I'm only at the beginning of it, you know, because the, the, the experiences, my gosh, you could, every time now that I feel like I go to one of those ancient sites, the spirit of the land or the she kind of connects with, contacts me or, or is in communication with me in some way or another. And that's a really beautiful and rich thing. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I was at down in Cork at Drum Beg last year again. Yeah. And I had a very bad fall there. I thought I broke my Did leg. You? And oh, I nice. felt I was I felt like I was pushed. Oh, I was just gonna say I felt that the energy was the, the vibration was quite low at Drum Beg, actually. That Isn't was my there, there's something it's not a it's not a friendly, welcoming place. No, no, no I agree with you there. It's a perfect stone circle. It's yeah. like it's like it, it would be like the the, the model stone circle it's perfect right yeah, but, exactly yeah but I, I fell there and i can really hurt my leg i thought it broke it but i didn't i just sprained it and then mm. you know we got drunk in the spaniard and can sail so that like to medicate it but yeah, you to I, I, I went back to dublin on 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 the train with a leg that was like oh, that's, that's terrible that's really oh, yeah. awful. but i got that sense of i felt happening. like i was pushed i felt like someone got, got behind me, me. wow wow yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. But they, they, they'll all they'll all yield something of their magic or, or their, their or their energy. Like I feel there's something a little bit hollowed out about Drum Big. I, I didn't feel the magic there in the way that I'd hoped to, you know, yeah. because like you say, visually, it's the perfect stone circle and you expect all sorts of wonderful things to emanate from it. But it, it wasn't the case. I didn't have that experience. With, and I'm sorry that you, you hurt your leg there. But uh, when I went to the Gallstown Dolmen now in, in Waterford, that was a good experience as well. Well, first I went, it was it became like a mission. Which Dolmen? It's a Gallstown dolmen in, 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 in Waterford. It's, it's, it's in it's County Waterford, it'd be in Kilmeadon. I don't know. I know Cairnstown, Cromlech, the huge one in Carlow. Yeah, I've yeah, I I yet to go I, to that I, one. I've never been to this one, okay. It's, Tell us about it. it's really, really beautiful. But um, I was there, I was with a friend of mine, and she also happens to be an artist. And so we were kind of like, we were on this mission to, to go there anyway. And um, the 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 fucking GPS went haywire on us, like so. I I said, look, we 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 pull in here. So we got to we got to Kilmeadon anyway, and we pulled in around the back of the petrol station, and there was just one one woman standing there, and she was in her like her, she was working in the deli, I reckon, and she was she was just having a cigarette. And I got out of the car and I said, listen, do you know like do you know the gold stand on and do you know how to get there? And she just she just lit up she was like oh she she knew that place she loved that place that was her place like you know so she told us exactly how to get there and but she also said like that there was um at the not far from the dolmen was the canuck on kylie Vaughan, the not the, the the hill of the white witch and uh she she just she just knew the magic of that place and you knew from talking to her like you know and um there was something very aligned about that, you know, to, to, to the only person in this small village who would just would know the, the place so intimately, oh, yeah. like, you know, that I felt like that the, the custodian or the, or the guardian of that place was kind of wel welcoming us in in that moment. And it, it was really it was really lovely, like, you know, so when we finally got there, then. You know, the, the, the dolmen was, was it was a really beautiful dolmen. But when we went up the, the Canuck and Kylie Bon, um, we felt this since this this profound need for reverence. And so we took off our shoes and we were barefoot and uh like we weren't the same people yeah. leaving as we were when we, when we arrived. Like there was something very pure and something very beautiful that passed through us it, it being there. And and it was but I love that. I love the way the, the universe or infinite intelligence kind of you know when you're on that 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 quest like that that things line up for you like i really love that you know so i'm, I'm fascinated by ross helen tidal dolman down there in cork too as well mm -hmm. the one that's half in the sea well mm -hmm. it's, all, it's all the sea now because that, that just says, shows to me that 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 this my whole theory is that like probably atlantis thing was at major sea level in the or sea rise in the past and that's why this thing is this thing is like goes under the sea actually goes over it when the tide comes in and it's yeah. underwater all the time. I find that an amazing one as well. There's something mm -hmm. a, there's something, but it's kind of it's kind of it's got a darkness again, a spookiness does about it. it. Does it? Have you you've been to it? Like you've 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 actually been you've you've been there, yeah. 
and not, not just on the bay looking across at it, but I have looking across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The woods coming down the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I haven't seen that one either. That's that's another one. There's a lot to get around to. Like, oh, that's I, a good one because you get you get to it. it sometimes you got it's it's got sea, it's, the probably the only dolmen I know that has seaweed gro- kelp growing off it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, amazing, that, that was built way inland. When it, when it was built and the sea level rises, obviously there was some kind of... There's also one up in Sligo here called... It's a stone circle. Mm. Uh, a place, an absolutely stunningly beautiful place. Mm. Your screen and, uh, and, and it's, it's called Cucullan Circle, the local name. Oh, and it's a stone circle under the sea. Under the sea. Uh, so when the tide goes out, you can see it, is it? You, you can't tide... even see it. You need to go out there with scuba to, scuba to see it. Uh, I would love that. I would absolutely love it's it. It's actually in the middle of the day. Like, um, like, so, like, it's a brilliant thing. Like, but it's in the most beautiful place, like Nochna, Ray, Queen Maeve's Cairn is, is on top. Is on yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, it's like, oh, like, 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 like stunning mountain. Yeah. The, the, yeah, the ancients had this tremendous understanding. They were artists. Wow. They had an understanding of the aesthetic of the land. Oh, my God, they did. Didn't they? they? Did. Oh, my goodness. Well, you you know, like, the, the, the panorama, like, the vista opens out in front of you. They absolutely knew very well what they were doing. Like oh, they, were, uh, they were picking these, these apex points of beauty, like, you know, to locate their sacred temples and their places of worship. So, yeah, they they really were. They were true artists. They were, they were living poets and artists of their time. Yeah. Like, but they were so aligned with nature. How could you not be? You know, exactly. they were so connected with the spirit of nature. And that brings out beauty in everything, you know. So that kind of ugliness that we have to endure these days, they didn't have to. Like, you know, it was different back then, you know. So, yeah. There was more purity in their lives. I think so. Definitely. Definitely. There was. Yeah. Over here in the U.S., I, uh, Thomas, you were talking about an under underwater um, uh, megalithic site. And I want to say we have some of those in the Great Lakes here, that there are underwater remains of, of a previous civilization. But what you guys were just saying about uh, the aesthetics of the landscape and building architecture around those aesthetics, I want to say that the, the people who originally laid out uh, the cities and most of the major cities in the U.S. were aware of those energy lines and the, the main streets, like even here in Seattle, uh, just the way that the energy flows on the main arteries there on, on uh, uh, Denny Way and, and, a, and a couple of the other main roads. It's like you can tell that the people who surveyed this initially originally were doing something with dowsing or, or they had some kind of spiritual technology to read the curvature of the land. But the layers of the decades or centuries of building on top of that has just kind of disrupted that natural flow. Like if it were a circuit board, you know, the circuit board is no longer no longer intact you know there's dirt on it so to speak but yeah that was freemasons yeah and Freemasons were very heavily involved in urban design Mm -hmm. and thomas Paine, who was you know the great anglo-american philosopher he actually coined the term united states of america he wrote a book on freemasonry a lot of people don't know about it's a fascinating read and he claims that the the freemasons came from the druids of ireland and uh, ireland france and italy and their mm-hmm. understanding of geomancy, the landscape, how to align, like we we're saying, Marie, about the stones in a certain, that that, came, that was a very ancient thing that came from pre-Druidic times that the Druids carried on. And eventually when the Druids became, well, the flight of the Earls, that's like my book that I wrote about this in the, in the, uh, the Druid Code, that when the old Gaelic Ireland collapsed with the end of the Battle of Kinsale down your way, uh, nearby, the, the 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 old Gaelic lords had to leave Ireland, and they took with them the last of the bards called the Fila, who were basically druids, and but just they were not they were secular druids, mm-hmm. and they all went to France, Italy, S- Spain, and at the same time, magically, a few years later, all these Masonic lodges, the Grand Orient, and all these Masonic lodges started popping up all over Italy, Spain, and France. So they his theory, I think, is bang on. And I think that eventually made its way to him. The Grand Orient was very, in Paris, was very influential on people like Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. Mm-hmm. And so that's how it got to America. Mm-hmm. In and it, that goes back right back to ancient Druidic things of the, the sympathetic relationship with the landscape. Mm-hmm. And you can probably even relate within New York, Thomas, with the, because it was what, New Amsterdam before the, the colonists were over here, right? And that, those, those, those lines are still there in New York, I want to say from some of the, uh, the original uh, surveys, but yeah, it's just, it's just been, it's been curtailed and it's like, I don't know if it's whomever 
whomever infiltrated the Freemasons or who, whomever took it over at this point. But it just it seems like, oh, well, that's gone to shit now. It's there's mm. no there's no <laughs> harmony with. Uh, yeah. But, but even in the face of that, though, you know, when you when you were navigating the urban landscape, like you know, there's this uh, there's this notion. There was a, a writer; his name was Michel de Chateau, and he spoke about how you know we become tactical drifters. Like we yeah. we we learn how to navigate, take the shortcuts. Like we know how to to move. We're we're like you know the way the animals will will they create the path through the land? They 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 know the most harmonious place in order to move. Like we're we're like that too in the urban landscape, even though it's been striated to such an extent. To suit the, the ideals of, of the Masons or, or, or the great cultural engineer, the, the you know, the, the urban engineers, we still tactically drift through those spaces, you know, and we make our own, you know, necessary magic as we move, you know, we'll, we'll little, uh, there'll be a little bookshop or a cafe or a friend, and we'll move gently through these spaces, even though they, they are so, you know, austere and, and difficult. We, we find our way because we're fluid, we're, 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 we're there's a huge percentage percentage of us that's a water so we, we have to move in that way you know regardless you know that's that's why cork city sounds feels much more relaxing to me than dublin even though i grew up in dublin mm. dublin is a masonic city all the streets are all laid out by masons and it's just like the the you know there's you see the obelisks and all that shite everywhere in mm. cork because it's built on a series of islands and the streets are much more in form with the landscape they're not mm. built to I think that it, it feels it feels more relaxed. It's more relaxed or something. I know it's a smaller city and everything, but it's more relaxed or something. I don't. You, you were you were like in those Masonic streets. You're guided like go here, or go there. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the, and there's the, you know big Patrick's Hill in Cork. Like you could. My dad came flying down there with no brakes in his car when when he was young. Like, but I mean, there, yeah, you're right. There's huge undulations and there's a river right through it. And, it does make a difference to your experience of the city. Like, well, I have took a photo. I have took a photograph there in the evening from the top of the hill. You know that park near the top of the hill where you can see over the whole city, mm. over the Shandon Bells and everything? Oh, yeah, yeah. And in the sky, I have a beautiful, the Crescent Moon and Venus right over the city. Oh, of beautiful. Yeah, it's a great yeah. And, all, and all you can see is its church spires. Yeah, there's lovely panoramas to be had yeah. around Cork. That's for sure. it's, it's quite spectacular, that view of the yeah. city. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cork's a good city. I like Cork. There's a good, good buzz to it, like, you know. So, yeah. But that's what Jason was saying. There's always... There's, a, there's an energy in the landscape that our ancient ancestors harnessed. And when you think about it, you're harnessing it too in your artwork. You know, you're, you're taking that out there from, from there. Now, do you, let me see. Uh, do, uh, I'm, I'm not, I know this is, a, 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 this is a redundant question, but uh, do you feel, because it, obviously it's obviously the case by looking at them and talking to you, do you feel certain paintings have a greater magical charge and i mean that in the consciousness sense than others like a certain painting you'll say to yourself there's something special about that that's happened to me a few times is that the, the yeah that's it, 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 it for sure yeah i mean it, it, it it's for sure like it, it it's it's about that you see i suppose inspiration has to find you working and diligent and worthy to some extent there's this, um, there's this wonderful alchemist, his name was um, Armand Barbeau. And he was, I, I know if you're familiar with him, he, he wrote that book, The Gold of a Thousand Mornings. Oh, it's yeah, kind of, yeah. He, it's a kind of a rare book, and I got a loan of it many years ago. And he was charting, you know, he, it, 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 was, it was a record of his opus magnum. And he, he was, you know, um, making these very penetrating studies about like the nature of, of, of sap and dew and plants and he, because he considered them the perfect receptacle for cosmic charge. But he spoke about them from the point of view, he, he spoke about his work and he spoke about the, the perfect psychological conditions in order for spirit to reach through to the work. And for him, it was this sense of like complete, absolute transparency, which he associated with wisdom. And a kind of a disinterestedness in the outcome and a, and a disassociation because you know so, so because i and i think a lot of artists and writers and poets and musicians would agree like that that there's no place for the ego in the creative process you know you 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 you, you just have to be open and working and 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 when you are when you, when you find yourself in that state of equilibrium you know it, it's a pure state you know it's it's you and the work and you're a receptacle because you're there, you've surrendered to the fact that I'm an artist, I am here, I'm surrendering to the fact that I am here to make work. 
and there's an equilibrium that can arrive, you know, out of, it's elusive, but when it does, then inspiration reaches through to the work and it, 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 um, it can be considered complete because you don't have to labor for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours, like you might with another work, you know, it's, spirit determines when it's finished. So yeah, there is magical charge in, in some works and not in others for sure, you know, it's evident because yeah, there's a lightness I think that comes with inspiration. And there's a there's there's the, there's the overburdened thought that 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 you know that 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 finds its expression on works too. And some people love that. You know, they love they love the chaos and the and the travail of the artist and the effort and everything. But the light, the lighter works. They, you know, the, the, the light when they come on the lighter wing, they they are in, they're more inspired for sure. I think, yeah. But it, you know, you don't know when that's going to happen. You just have to be working. This is why I love talking to visual artists more than I than musicians. I can't stand talking to most musicians and other composers because they're so analytical and straight lines with everything. But you talk to a visual artist and you'll say something like that about, you know, being re receptive and, and allowing, allowing whatever it is to come through into you. Because as a composer, especially when you're composing music that has no lyrics, you know, a lot, a lot of musicians are poets first and they, you know, they base mm -hmm. everything around words, but composing music that has no lyrics yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's a receptive thing. And there's so many musicians who do this thing about, oh, I spent fucking years on this and I blah, 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 blah. I practice it's like, but you can write something like a masterpiece in 10 minutes and it's complete because you're in that state of harmony, whatever you want to call it, so that something can, can come in. Yeah. yeah. And it's just visual artists understand that. And I, I haven't met very many musicians who, who get to that point you know, because they're also technical, technical music theory, you know, common practice music theory, no parallel fifths and bullshit like that. And, you know, all the, you know, oh, well, that chord's not supposed to go to that chord. And, oh, that 12 tone thing, you're not supposed to. Uh, I but think like, I understand that, though, to a certain extent, when you speak about it like that, like there's a kind of when, when I think back to when I was making the geometric work, you know, I, I was looking at kind of in some way, I was trying to investigate the, the underlying order, you know, that's, that's inherent in nature, but also was looking at, you know, exploring the geometric form from the point of view of how they could be emanations of cosmic intelligence, because, you know, at, at their root, you know, geometry is, is a kind of, is a cymatic, you know, it's a, it's a sound frequency made form. And so, but I always, I always felt the, the, the challenge in that, like I always, I always felt the challenge in, in speaking and, and writing about the geometries because, you're entering into the domain of the absolute, you know, pure mathematics. And that's kind of confronting in a way. So I don't know, it, it, is it the same for music, like in that sense, you know? It, I, it, is it, you're dealing with different kind of coordinates and different kind of, you know, a different system. I don't know. Yeah, I, I like having it as a secondary thought. Like a lot of composers in particular will start from the music theory and try to spin something up out of the music theory that hits you in the heart. I'd yeah. rather have something that hits me in the heart and then go, okay, I've got this set of rules that I've learned. Which rules do I want to take out of this as if I'm grabbing paints? I don't know. I'm not a painter, but like, yeah. I would look at them as like, okay, I want these brushes, these, you know, these textures and go in and take what I need rather mm -hmm. than trying to start by using the geometry, so to speak. Like I imagine mm -hmm. as a visual artist, you can do some very beautiful things where you start with the geometry and derive a piece of work out of it. But a lot of music that starts with music theory, it sounds like, um, it sounds like you're at composition school learning how to compose and it does it goes in one ear and out the other of the listener it doesn't make a loop in their heart so to speak and mm. spin around in their heart and do something captivate them yeah i know and, it has to yeah. In the heart, right? yeah. yeah i think with the with, when i was well from my experience as a visual artist working with the geometries like i felt like that i had to honor the, the dictates of what they are, you know, the austerity of their form. I couldn't mess with that in any way, otherwise I would lose that form. So I had to recognize the limits of that, you know, and play around the surface of the forms and in the background and stuff to see, could I release something from them? I mean, they are what they are, but I wanted to see if I could release something more of their essence. So what I did is I stayed with each form, maybe in the way of, I don't know, so I, I felt that there was some connection to sound and music in that. And I stayed with each form until I felt that they reached a pitch of expression or this kind of state of an internal hum, you know, or, or, or that they, they, they could exude this sort of sense of aura or vibration about them. And then I'd move on to the next work. But it, 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 was, like, it was like dealing with sound through paint. It was a strange experience, but I, I feel like I understand what you're talking about. You know, the, the, the theoretical and the, and, 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 and the straightiation and, you know, the, you know, the, 
the difficulty of dealing with the formulaic and then the, the, the fluidity of, of inspiration and, and things reaching to your heart, you know, so. But you still, you still have to have that formula. Yeah. Like yeah. even in music, Jason, you have to have your circle of fifths and your scales oh, yeah. and yeah. Your, your tuning even. And, uh, you know, that goes, you know, but that, I mean, there was, I saw a red, or red song, I can't remember where, but the Howard Goodall, who's like an English music critic, and he said that, like, we do pay a price for the Pythagorean scale that underlines all music, right? Yeah. But he could point to one piece of music, I think it was Mozart's Requiem Mass, that justifies it alone, you know? So even if you have the underlying structure, mm-hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't deter the magic. Mm-hmm. We had a... Uh, Ramsey Jukes on the other night saying the same thing. And he studied, Maria, he studied uh, pure mathematics at Cambridge. And he ended up being a magician, uh, mm. in, in, instrumental in, in the chaos magic movement. So mm. it's, it's, yeah. it's still relevant. It still works, you know, it's still it, there. It works. It's, it, it works. It, 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 it's that's the thing. But I felt like I was extremely, like, if I, was, I was really shit at maths when I was a kid going to school, you know. I was just, it just felt like, you know, it, all logic then ended with me like you know but I felt like I was kind of resolving that when as an adult then when I started to make these works in geometry so it's not to say that yeah you can be a mathematician or a physicist but you can also be a magician like we get to integrate these aspects of ourselves that we're kind of we we couldn't sort of gather in as a kid like but as an adult you get to approach them in a different way that works for you you know so for me it was kind of resolving some sort of trauma I had around, you know, st- studying maths in school it was was to be able to to create these ge- geometries and understand the logics of them. And I'm pretty good too when it comes to like you know figuring things out, like you know, d- general engineering and stuff like that. I'm I'm pretty good in that way. But it was just there was something there about mathematics where I had a blockage, and this was a way of kind of resolving that or integrating it to some extent. And I, it's great to have art for that. It's a great soul medicine in that sense, art, you know. Yeah, well, if you look at Irish music, right, like Irish music only became formalised around like the 1600s, around Turlock O'Calloran and people like that brought classical kind of disciplines to Irish music. And uh, that's we have reels and dr- jigs and reels because of it, not Irish. But if you listen to the Shanos music, that comes like the gyps, that's almost like the gypsy music. That mm. came from the pre-Pythagorean, pre-Circle of Fifth kind of world. Mm. And it does have a haunting element, like gypsy music because it's outside the pale it mm-hmm. does have that haunting quality too that's almost i wouldn't say unsettling but it's almost like you're not used to it that kind of thing yeah otherworldly yeah. otherworldly i get that from it sometimes some i get that from some kinds of rock art like that mm-hmm. native I, I get that from a lot of native american rock art more than anything else because it's so different than anything i know not a negative thing i'm just saying but it's a good. It's good to confront that because it becomes a kind of a catalyst. Put in your own work and your own thinking. Yeah. I thought you were yeah. saying art rock is in uh, art, artful rock, but yeah, rock art too. Yeah. But I was thinking like <laughs> Pink Floyd and, and otherworldly stuff like that, where it doesn't go into the orthodoxy, but it goes into this otherworldly characteristic. And I try to bring that in with my music to to keep it very formulaic in some ways, but just bring in something from a different dimension you know, straight down the diagonal of it from a different place. I have a friend in, I have a friend in Dublin who's a, uh, he's a professor and he's, uh, he's in genetics and he's Mr. Like atheist, straight up materialist. He listens to the most out there crowd prog rock you could imagine. Like even stuff, you even stuff Germans, like prog heads have an aired off. And it's like, how do you, how do you, how did you get, <laughs> you know, it's so funny, you know. <laughs> Yeah, the shadow side. Like everybody has their, you know, their their closet, like where they keep all their weirdness, you know. But it, that's the beauty of being human, isn't it? Like there's there's so many aspects to all of us, like and and we get to explore it. And that's the beauty of art as well, like you know, whether it's music, poetry, writing, whatever that we get to express, like you know, what that there's this lovely um, thinker. I think she was a contra- cultural anthropologist, and uh, I only came across her recently. Her name is Angeli. Ari, Ariane or something like that a flipper I don't remember her name but she said something lovely like you know that we're, we're all original medicine you know and like that there's in indigenous cultures there's no word for comparison because there's no need for it it doesn't exist like each individual is bringing something incredibly unique like you know so it's, there's something wonderful about what it is to be human and and, and how, how that concocts to make all these unique medicines and we are the cure for whatever malaise we have we are the cure like, you know so well, that's a that's the hour just flew, and that's a beautiful way to wrap it up. I'm not going to editorialize or extrapolate upon that. We are the medicine. I love that. Yeah. Jason, do you have anything to say to Maria before we go away? 
again, just such an inspiration. Again, I love, I love talking to visual artists who, who get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was lovely talking to you, Jason. I really enjoyed it. Well, Maria, um, we have your uh, website we put at the bottom of uh, this, the thing as it's going along. Is there anything else you want to, uh, I mean, we're in a prison camp here in Ireland, so there's no exhibitions, but is there any, any do you do online cr- things or anything like that? I, do I do online things? I don't. I don't do on, online things. I have my website. I I do online things actually. I do. I have Facebook, and I and I sometimes whenever I make new work, um, I have been on a stall at the moment because I'm trying to make a portrait of my daughter for her 21st birthday. So it's you know it's taking all of my time and attention. So, but I, when I make new work, I put it up there on on the Facebook, and I write a little bit around the work, not about the work necessarily, but around the work, and it's because that's my research, and I'm learning, and I want to share what I'm learning. I'm on Instagram too. I'm I'm a bit of a luddite, but I, I I do these things because I think we have to to some extent, you know, share okay. share share our original medicine. So right. yeah, I, I'm online. I can be found, you know, around the place. Yeah, so I'll put the Instagram links and the other ones in the bottom of the description box, and uh, yeah, you know, people can follow your work there and see it progress as I have over the years. Listen, Maria, that was fantastic. Uh, thanks for coming very much. I'm delighted with this and. Uh, Maybe in the future, if you're doing an exhibition or something or a new series of paintings, come on and talk about it. It'd be brilliant. Yeah, I'd love that. I, I really enjoyed this, Thomas. And thanks oh. so very much for having me. It was an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Maria. And this has been another episode of BR313 Symposium. And if you're wondering, if you're wondering why the week in Strange is late this week, we had technical gremlins. It should be up by tomorrow. So it'll be... It'll be, it'll be at the end of the week this time, but it is on the way. So uh, don't worry about that. And uh, thanks again for joining. We're near, we're near 10,000 subscribers. Get us a few more. And we'll hit that important threshold and uh, support all the people you see on this wonderful channel. And uh, thank you very much and look after yourselves. Have a good weekend. Bye.